Well, hi, friends. Um, let's see, a couple things. That this is the weekend that the convening general conference of the Global Methodist Church is meeting in Costa Rica. And so you can pray for those meetings. It is, it is the kind of thing where you're praying to th thank God for the good work that he is doing, for him to, him to bless, to lead the speakers. Uh, Dale Fincher is, is down in Costa Rica as a representative from our conference. And so right about now, he's listening to a good sermon. So, well, yeah, they're two hours behind. They, they started at eight. So anyway, um, and so I wanted you to, because I'll be lifting up that when we come to the time of prayer and also be lifting up, well, I'll share as, as, as we begin. Actually, I've one thing at a time. Hope Sunday video. Okay, I'm not that confused, but was looking at something. We're going to uh, just enjoy Hope Sunday for the seventh time. Uh, that for seven years, the, uh, the Empower Tusk and the Tuscarora, Tuscarora County Anti-Drug Coalition and, of course, T4C, the Tuscarora County Council for Church and Community, has partnered with local churches to uh, celebrate a Hope Sunday to talk about the issues of drug addiction for where, where deliverance and help comes from. And uh, it has grown. It's nice to give you good, good news that something has grown. They were, when they start out, they, they felt good to have maybe 30 churches between Tuscarawas and Stark County share the video and, 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 uh, and talk about this, lift it up in prayer. And now there's 100 churches just in Tuscarawas County alone. Um, that that are designating this as Hope Sunday. It's not something where you're asked to donate. You're asked to, you know, this this flyer here on the back of it has a lot of addiction and counseling resources that people need. Uh, if you want to know one of the more common questions that uh, you might get in a church or might get as a pastor is about a, a situation where addiction is causing havoc in somebody's life and where can I get help? Uh, it's also... Um, just a blessing that, that uh, as the recovery community uh, knows that, that there, is, there is a place for, for the services, for the counseling, but people get better also way more often, get, get through this when they come to faith in Christ and trust the, the powerful saving God that we know. And so we're likely to see ourselves working together because we are looking to see lives transformed from brokenness to wholeness. And so the, the video has uh, two individuals speaking on it, and, and the one gentleman will talk about his, you know, again, how he came to be, have, have a terrible addiction problem, um, his journey outward of it. It's to encourage us and to remember that God is a God who authors full and complete salvation. So, so you can go ahead and start the Hope Sunday video. Welcome to Hope Sunday. God has been transforming the lives of so many people and there are still people that need a touch from God to be set free from the chains of addiction. We're excited to share with you another amazing story of God crashing into someone's life, transforming their life, and then using them to do the same thing in other people's lives. Enjoy. My name is Marcus McFalling. I'm from Seaside, California. I was born into so much brokenness. My dad left before I was born, so I had no idea who I was. I was just looking for somebody to tell me, and I found this game called football. I love the game because what I put in the game, I got out. It was like the harder I hit people, the more my coaches cheered and I was a really good athlete. I was a four star recruit in high school. I was recruited by all kinds of division one schools, but unfortunately I didn't have any discipline inside of the home. My home was chaotic. There was gang violence, there was drug activity. And the only thing I wanted to do was make it out, but I had no discipline. If I don't graduate from high school, I can't accept any of my scholarships. And so I'm playing junior college football. And my friend shows me this little school called Malone College. And I had never been to Ohio. I had never seen the snow. I had no idea but God had a plan for my life. You see, God will always speak to you even when you're not necessarily listening. But I finally stepped on this plane and I came to Ohio and things were crazy. I'd never seen the snow, but I did really well at Malone 2011. I finished sixth in the country in rushing and I got a chance to work out in front of all 32 NFL teams. My dreams were coming true. The thing that I wanted the most was getting ready to take place. I was excited because so much pain and anger and resentment was in my heart and I wanted to prove everybody wrong. 
as I'm working out for all these NFL teams. I'm doing exceptional, but unfortunately, I didn't get drafted, but I played four years in the Arena Football League. My dreams were coming true. I met a beautiful woman. We're engaged to be married. The thing that I wanted the most was getting ready to happen in 2014. I get a chance to work out for the Dallas Cowboys, and I was excited. Just imagine being an inner city kid who had overcome so much adversity, so much pain, so much brokenness, to potentially be standing at the face of your dreams, and that's where I was at. But unfortunately, in that workout, I blew my shoulder out, cracked my clavicle, tore my rotator cuff, and tore my labrum. For the first time in my life, I had no idea what to do. My identity was rooted in the game, and it was shook, and I had some choices to make. The only thing I knew to do were to take the pain medication that the doctors prescribed me, and I became a completely deceived drug addict for 1,173 days. I had no idea what to do. I had no choices. I didn't understand that there was more for my life because my, my entire being was completely gone and the only thing I knew to do was get high. I started buying drugs off the streets but then my wife gets pregnant and what I wanted to be more than anything was a father. I wanted to be the dad that I didn't have. And so I said, okay, Chelsea, well, let's go back to Ohio and get back around all the Christians because maybe some of them can tell me that there's more for my life. Maybe some of them can remind me that God is still for me because I had no idea what to do. But you see, my issues followed me all the way from Texas all the way back to Ohio. And this time I'm sitting here in Ohio with no team doctors. And I came up with a great plan to go to every single doctor that I could find and get high. I lied to so many different doctors. I went to 38 different doctors for 59 prescriptions in five months just in Ohio. That's how bad my addiction was. I was a completely broken man on the inside and I had no hope, I had no idea what to do with my life. There's so many people that are walking around every single day with that mentality. This time my depression's at an all time high, my anxiety is through the roof and the only thing I wanna do is potentially leave this world. But on my first Father's Day, I remember, like it was yesterday, the cop crew just come in front of the house. I had warrants for my arrest because of my drug addiction and I lied to all those different doctors and I had some choices to make. And as I'm looking and I see the cop cruisers, they took my daughter from me and they took me away to jail for the first time. And I sat inside of a cell. And everything that had just happened, the only thing I could think about was I needed to get out so that I can get high again. That's how strong drugs are. But on my first Father's Day, my wife left me. I was sitting there by myself a few days later and I had some choices to make. And she was in hiding because I was an unsafe person to be around. And the only thing I wanted to do was say goodbye to my daughter. I just wanted to say goodbye and I'm sorry that I was becoming the dad that you didn't deserve. But one FaceTime phone call changed my life. I looked at my little girl through the screen. My wife finally picked up and I said, Avery, I felt the love of a father to a child like never before. I said, Avery, daddy is going to do whatever he has to do to be in your life. The next day I checked myself into this faith-based rehab called Teen Challenge. And the only way to accurately say it is the devil should have killed me when he had me. He should have took me out all throughout the program. I began to read the Bible and I began to understand that there was so much more for my life, that God saw me, that he was for me, that he cared about me that he had plans for my life, but uh, transparency is the only thing that leads to transformation. So I got so transparent. I said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And I felt the Lord tell me, plead guilty to your felony. So I stood in front of a judge, guilty as can be. I said, judge, listen, I did it. The judge looks at me, she begins to cry. She says, I've never had somebody be that honest in my courtroom. She said, go back to Teen Challenge. And I sit before you guys today without a record whatsoever. And the program God gave me this dream of starting an organization called Reach One, where I get a chance to travel around the world and inspire a generation and telling them who they are. I ended up graduating the program God got brought complete transformation and reconciliation back to my family. I've been married now 10 years to the same beautiful woman. We have two beautiful little girls. And just last year alone, we got a chance to speak to 256,000 people in person. And we're just getting started. To God be the glory. The Bible is the only thing that has the authority to tell you who you are. And God is who he says he is. All you have to do is trust him, trust his word. He transformed my life. I haven't thought about drugs in over seven years because our God is faithful. He's near to the brokenhearted. And if he can restore me, he can restore anybody. God bless you guys. So I want to challenge you. When you see someone that's hurting and broken, are you looking at them like they're a problem or an opportunity for God to transform their life and get even more I want to encourage you guys. If you want to get involved, there's a QR code on the pamphlet. You can scan that, get access to all the resources in the community. And I want to challenge you as well to begin to pray for somebody, to begin to love on somebody, believing that it's an amazing opportunity for God to do what only He can do in that life.
In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that's what we believe as people with addiction, people whose lives have been broken and badly damaged through the power of, it, of, of drugs and alcohol. They find new life, new hope in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to lift the, the recovery community and those struggling with addiction up in our prayers. We're going to lift up our, those on our prayer list, as you can read. Well, in the tablet is uh, listed John Gibson, uh, 91 years old, fell and, and broke his hip. Also, Karen Jones, known to many of you, comes here. Uh, she had an auto accident uh, yesterday, as far as we can tell, was when it was. And uh, she's in Mercy Hospital. They're talking about letting her out today. So, But you want to call Karen, check with her, John, and, and see what they need. So let's be, let's be together in prayer. Lord, we want to first pray for, for those that are, that are right now. They're, they're in recovery. They're seeking help. Uh, they're, they, they know the, the problem and the challenge of their addiction. And Lord, they're finding, finding from you the strength. They're finding people come alongside them. They're finding the, the power in their lives to make the right choices. Lord, we're praying for those that, that are still under the, under the sway and the bondage of addiction. And we ask, Lord, that you... you Bring them near to your heart. Open for them a door of life. Help and come alongside those that are, that are assisting and assisting and, and leading and healing people from addiction. Love, we pray for our first responders, for the heavy burden they bear of, of, of calls for overdoses and, other pro and, and related problems. Lord, we ask then that our community be blessed. Bless this community with compassion, with seeing the opportunity and the resource that you can find in even the most broken. Lord, we pray for the churches in this community. Might you strengthen them, bless the messages that will be spoken this day. Lord, we ask that your blessing be on the Global Methodist Church on its, on its convening conference, on all the speakers and their decisions. Just ask, Lord, that you set before us both the opportunity and the resources and the guidance that we shall need. Lord, we pray for our unspoken requests. We pray today that what, what we've not shared, what we hardly know how to put words around, Lord, might your redeeming power be seen even before we know how to ask. Lord, we ask that these who are sick and need healing be, be brought before you. Lord, your son Jesus, who laid his hands upon the sick and healed them all, we ask his healing and help for John Gibson and for Karen Jones, for Jacob Hoagland and Pam Miller, for Ed Fry and Jerry Botters, for Nicole Chambers, Karen Cheney, Joyce Greco, Carol Allison. Lord, we ask that your peace be upon Jerusalem. As we, have, as we have lifted up. Lord, might your hand be with those who serve us in the military, particularly those who are facing and are in the midst of a deployment. Would you shorten that time that they're away from family? Be their defender, be their protection. Lord, for our nation, we ask, Lord, that you be that, that which supplies us and shields us from danger and guides us. Help hearts to acknowledge you as Lord in this place and in this land. Set your hands on the hearts of our leaders. Guide them in the way you would have them to go. Lord, in this world where there's, there's so many areas where, that which have known great want, where food cannot be gotten because of conflict or remoteness. Lord, where, where war has raged back and forth, we ask for your blessing of peace. We ask that you turn aside the plans of those who plan evil and harm. Lord, we also ask that world leaders they would, they would acknowledge your, your will and your greatness, but also, Lord, have your hands on them. Guide them, put them to the work that you would have them to do. Lord, we pray for our homes. We pray, Lord, that, that within our houses you have love between husband and wife, parent and child. We ask your blessing on our families. We ask your blessing on those whom we love that are not near or who are traveling. 
We ask your goodness and care to be on those who, who are indoors all the time, in care centers. We ask, Lord, for, for this help to be with them, that today be a day of blessing. We ask, Lord, for your help and your care upon the church that is not free, where persecution from, from the state or from, or from their own communities is, is, is a daily challenge. Just ask, Lord, that you rescue those from jails, from execution, showed her your church, but give it many opportunities to share this gospel. Lord, just ask us as we bring our needs before you, our hearts are focused before you. Hear us as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, if you, in, in your Bible, you can, you're welcome, you're invited, encouraged to turn to Psalm number 144, which is where I'll be preaching out of. Um, I'll be preaching out of verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, but the whole psalm has encouraging things to say, has beautiful, beautiful verses, and, and uh, I realize that you can think a lot faster than, than I talk. So if you're looking at some of the other verses, that's fine. Uh, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 in Psalm 144 say, Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains so that they smoke. Flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Send out your arrows and rout them. Stretch out your hand from on high. Rescue me and deliver me from the many waters, from the hand of foreigners whose mouths speak lies and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. And Lord, we would ask that you would come down, that you would be near, that your power would be made evident, and that your hand be upon us to save. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you can't be too careful if you're, if you're, if you're a preacher. If you keep reading the Bible, and, and it's recommended that I do so, okay? If you're reading the Bible, you'll come, come into the Psalms. In fact, I was struck by all the Psalms from 140 to 150. Uh, perhaps I'd not looked at them as closely. You're, you can't be too careful because you'll read something phenomenal and then you'll want to preach about it. Now, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7 in this psalm are not the prettiest of the verses in that psalm. Okay, that, that, they're not as profound as saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Um, you know, it's not, as, not as, uh, as beautiful as saying, may our sons and their youth be like plants full grown and our daughters like corner pillars. Uh, it, it, you know, it does something there. He starts out, praising God and talking about what God has done for him so far, trains his hands for war and readies him for the conflict. And he ends talking about what it looks like for a people to be blessed. And that, oh, that's, 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 that's good, to, good to listen to. You gotta, gotta follow that. I'm, I'm waiting. I was visualizing this week what the blessing of may there be 10,000s of sheep in our land, right? That's in there. 10,000 sheep walking through New Philadelphia would cause a stir. That would be something. That would be Facebook worthy. Now, but if you're, if you're writing in Hebrew, you, you haven't had an English teacher, and, and, I, and I very much love the English teachers that I had. They, 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 something resonated with what they were teaching and what I was thinking. You know, they didn't have an English teacher that said, if you're writing something, put the main point, your theme first, and then the supporting things, and then you might restate what you're going to say, and that makes a paragraph or an essay. It's not how it was done in the Hebrew. If you had an important thing, you tended to put it in the middle with stuff, in the, stuff before it and stuff after it. In the middle of this psalm, where, we're, where I read today, is the prayer. What, what's occurring from verse 5 to verse 8 
is David is praying. This, he's lifting a prayer to God, and this is what he's asking from God, asking God to do. So that makes it fair that, that look, we're, we're going to have our spiritual struggles. We're going to have our doubts and times, times of great difficulty. And David, being this one, lifted up in Scripture. His, his voice rings through the Psalms. His story goes through, you know, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings and in Chronicles. We know that God is working through David, and we're going to look for a moment at his prayer. Because if he's praying, I'm saying he's, he knows something about praying, and also God is at work in his life. Which is shows us, which comes forth in what he prays. So that's why we're here. And you discover first off that David has problems, and specifically, he has people that he's asking God, flash forth the lightning and scatter them. Okay, so this is a them kind of a prayer. This is not the prayer that when you wake up, the coffee's perfect, there are squirrels waving at you through the window, and the sun is shining and everything. No, this is a, this is a prayer given in trouble, and that trouble is related to people and uh, enemies. In fact, uh, the, you know, it says foreigners, and, and realize, first off, that probably doesn't mean what we think. I mean, even legitimate foreigners to David. People from another country might be as far away as Cambridge. Doesn't seem that far away. They didn't talk that different and act that different sometimes. And also it seems like their opposition is to what God is doing through David, which makes it more personal, make it more likely that they're people he knows quite well or has dealt with in the past, but they're foreigners or they're strangers, is another way this is, this is uh, translated, because they lie. It's not an attribute of the people from someplace else that they lie, but these people are strange to David. He can't mesh with them. He cannot, you know, form bonds. He cannot say they're living by the same covenant because they lie, and their hands are right hands of falsehood. David has these adversaries, which means God has adversaries in this picture. What is going on in the, in the, in the story of David is, is you, can, you can put this, it, it'd be sort of what the English teacher would call the theme of the whole thing, right? God is doing his work through David's life. He is channeling his blessings for Israel through David's life. The salvation that God is bringing in the generation that, that where this kingdom was established, that salvation was all channeled through David's life. There's a few other characters in Scripture, but you can, in, in this, these passages of Scripture, Abner and some of these other ones, but no, it's David. And when David says, I need rescued from the many waters, that means there's some people who want him swept away, who want him, well, none of these things that God is trying to do in his life to be accomplished. This is the situation that makes David pray. He is, you know, I, David knows about thanking God. David knows if it's a beautiful day and things have gone well, you want to praise God, but he is praying out of this place of trouble. And he's saying, I need rescued from the many waters. Now, what does he ask for? His, his prayer, we're learning from it, his prayer. He first asks for God's presence. Bow the heavens, O Lord, and come down. Do you realize that the, 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 it works well as a lesson of prayer if you just stop right there? Bow your heavens, O Lord, and come down. David recognizes that, that you know, we, we can talk about our many needs. I can make a long list of things I need God to do. I could list, God, list for God all the, if I'm da David, I have a lot of enemies. I have a lot of you know, fan fantastically complex or challenging problems, just be near. This is a prayer for God's presence. And there is wisdom in that because you might have all the needs and, and quandaries and puzzles in your mind and challenging things, but what you need is the presence of God. And there's a grace in the Old Testament. There is a presence of God in the Old Testament. There is his responsiveness to prayer, and David reaches out to that says, 
this is, this is what I mean. This is when your friend is in trouble, a heartache, a catastrophe, and you call, as we all have, and say, is there anything I can do? And the, it now and then happens where the friend says, can you come over? That was my first experience of uh, ministering in grief before I was anything like a minister. Um, we had a good family, um, good family friend, good family friends, and one night the father passed away suddenly, and his heart attack. It was long before they had as many interesting and useful things to do for a heart condition. He was gone pretty much before anybody could do anything. And we were, we were, our families were close, we were tight. And so once the phone call came through and there, there were about second people that called after the emergency squad, can you come over? That was something to spend with me at about 12 years old, my brother spending the night with the two sons of that family that were close in our age. Just come is what David says, just come. Then he invites God, he says, God, you need to use your power. I need to see a demonstration of your strength. You cannot accuse David of having too small of a God, can you? He says, light the mountains on fire. Spread forth your lightnings and scatter them. Send your arrows out and rout them. I think it's informative that David has people who are absolutely opposed to what is going on in his life that God is pouring through his life to help Israel and to make it, make it safe and secure and center it around God. And he doesn't ask God just to fry them into little at, bits of ash. He says scatter, round. Gives that sense that these are people that you know it's, it's because they have, they have turned aside. They're, 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 they're trying to twist the story of what God is doing in David's life. Thus David says, I'm close to being swept away. He needs God to change this. The problem, he says, is I need your hand to save me from the many waters. He finds the peril that much and he knows, he counts on that God is a God who will pull you out of that kind of situation. See, many waters doesn't mean he's just wet or taking a dip, you know. Might need to swim a little bit. You, you, you remember when it rained? It used to rain around here. You remember that, don't you? You know, uh, I, I love having a river go through the town, and I... I will, I will go down to the river and check it out, especially, you know, when it, when the river's high. It's much more exciting there. And I'm, I'm at a nice vantage point on that little river going through there is after it had rained a good bit, the water, the river was swelled up. Um, I would never think of kayaking on that, you know, because you'd find me in some sorry condition down in Newcomer's Town in about 15 minutes, probably, if I got in the water up here on one of those days, because it was rushing. And I saw a tree, I mean a big tree, floating down the middle of that river faster than you could walk. Just, you know, to keep up with it. Faster than I could run because I'm slow. That's what swept away is. Moved on, powerful current, never to be seen again. That river stood by the river, that tree wherever it came from was by the riverbank all that time. People stood by it. People looked at the birds nested in it. People had their hands rested on it. It was about the landscape, but once the waters rose, it was gone. This is what is at stake that David is praying about. Because in David's life, God is bringing about the fulfillment of his promises that he has promised to give Israel a good land, that he's brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. I'm going to put you in a good land and make you dwell secure. And he has promised to build David's house, that not the house that he lives in, but, but his whole family in the line of descent and, and pointing out that in, the, in due time the Messiah will come from that. And then the remarkable thing, 
of a community, a nation centered on God. That's what you see in the scriptures once God is done working through David. And this is what is at stake. This is what David does not want swept away. And so he's looking at that and, and he says, Lord, I need you to work with your power to change entirely what, with this direction this is going. I don't, he, he, it's not very specific. Send your lightning, send your arrows. No, this is, this is God's deal. It's God's business to see this have, happen. David is saying, saying, first, Lord, I need your presence. Lord, may you show your power. And then, rescue me. He demonstrates the faith that A, that God does come to us. His presence is a real thing. He knows that the heart needs, and he demonstrates the faith saying, I can call on God, plead with him, and tell him how much I need to know him near, and he will answer that prayer. And think about that. This, this book ends that you can call upon God, and God is the sort of God who will look at your sorry condition, at your great risk, and he will reach his hand down and pull you out of the water. God who cares about you so much. God who, as busy as God is, as cosmic as are God's concerns, he will draw near to you. And when David seems to visualize that God would get up from his throne and move himself and bend the heavens and come down near, that is his picture of the loving and caring God. And it is right alongside the God of cosmic power. The God who can light the mountain on fire with a, with a word and send forth the lightnings. These two aspects of God are not at all easy to keep together. The pagan world knew of the power of God and just assumed that you wouldn't want to get near the one ruling God that was behind all the others because he probably wasn't interested in talking to you. And if he made too much noise, he'd probably just get irritated. That seriously is the attitude of the pagan world. And yet we have this God that David knows is so mighty and also so caring. That's the faith of David. That's the faith the Bible puts before us in the Old Testament. And it's what God accomplished in, in response to David's need because he fulfilled those promises. The promises were made to Israel that they would come to a good and safe land. They would, everyone would sit under his own vine and fig tree. There would be safety in all around. And in David's day, they could say, this came true. And David, God said he would, this would be his kingdom, but he would build and establish David's house. And from that line would come the Messiah. And he has done that. And God aimed for the people of Israel to be a nation centered on God. And that is the picture of what you have in Scripture. This is what David aims to see happen in his life. This is what he prays fervently. He realized it can, also, it can not only be swept away, but it can be kind of turned, twisted, perverted. That's why you have that word liar in there or dealers in falsehood. Because you see, if it's an entirely different story if David becomes mighty, if he builds a big capital city in Jerusalem, if he has armies all around him and all the security from his enemies that he wants, but nothing about his life is all that totally centered upon God, then there's no fruitfulness. There's no redemption. There's nothing there to build on the promises that God will one day send the Savior. Now that's the faith of, Christ, of David. And that's what God did in response. He fulfilled his promises in David. So we can assume that David said, I need your help. I need your power to be demonstrated. I need you to turn this thing around for me, and I need you to reach down and rescue me. And God did all those things because we know that David survives his adventures to set his son upon the throne of Jerusalem and have a nation centered around God. Now, if that's David's prayer, what about ours? So first off, we might have the sense to pray for God's presence. You know, in fact, that is easy to miss. I can get so fascinated reading, you know, what I, okay, a verse like says, touch the mountains and set them aflame and send forth your lightnings to scatter them. That, that impresses me. 
or it, you know, just uh, is overlaid with all sorts of theological questions that, it, that fascinate me greatly. And if I get to that point before I stop and say, but David is asking God to be present with him. I can call upon God to be present with me. In fact, I have a greater assurance because Jesus has shown himself to be the one to come to us. And he said he will never leave me nor forsake me. He said he will pour his Holy Spirit out upon us and that that spirit will dwell within. This is a prayer God wants to answer. And I should have sense enough to ask for it. Not to get involved with what the details are, with what the, the problems in front of me at this point are, whether I look good or whether I look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, that's another problem. No, none of this is the, the longing in your heart, whether you recognize it or not. Your deepest desire is based that you would have God near. That there be a relationship of love and a presence and a closeness of God in your heart that you would say it's all very well to form words and throw them up to heaven so that he might answer me in due time. No, I want God near. And are you ready for that? That's a question. That's, that's a good prayer for us to do. Are you question? Is, are, if God is going to be present in your life, are you ready to make room for him? Are you ready to make room for him? Because I know how cluttered our lives get. I know how much noise is going on. I know what the calendar looks like. And I know about your obligations. God will be present in your life if you call upon him. But many times we have to say, well, am I ready to make that room? I'd better ask him. I'd, I'd better call upon him, ask him to be present. And realize he will come in as Lord, even of your calendar, even of your bank account, even of your close relationships. And then you're going to make it even harder by calling upon his power. Power is a dicey thing. If God's power is to come and be present in our lives, and, we, and he will, you will see things that, that troubles and difficulties, they will scatter before the Lord. I guarantee whatever you're worried about right now, you come, you come back in 40 years and see if any of those things are remembered or topics of conversation or even issues. We have been at this for centuries and have seen people rise up and declare that the church is meaningless and is soon to be on its way out, and yet we are still here. To recognize there are adversaries, call upon God. Have a big enough God to realize he can change the whole situation and pray for those large things with this one warning. If the power of God is going to upend, upend this world so much that, that, that sin will be defeated, we must talk about the sin in our own lives. About the places where we are in danger that the, the almighty and the all-holy God won't stand for it in us either. You know, where there, there is great risk in our times. We have seen some elaborate and startling lies that, that, that attack just the church, that, that, you know, marriage isn't what it's supposed to be, and, and a church need not concern itself with an account of every human life, that, uh, that there's no such thing as a God who speaks and gives a definitive revelation. You know, realize, I'm pretty sure, right along with David, the, the falsehoods that the enemy that are in the enemy's right hand are not about trivialities it's not a falsehood about whether you got an a or a b in english composition no it's a falsehood about the basic standards of how we are to live our lives before a holy god there are people they're not a conspiracy but they're just a life that is around us that expects the church to disappear, expects us all to fade away like the dinosaurs, would be happy if we never taught children anything about the Lord, would be ecstatic if we just suddenly stopped bothering. They're going to be greatly disappointed, but they truly think they're on the way in and we're on the way out and would work to see, it, see this stop. It's like I could get a a jar full of examples, and the one that 
leaped out was Vladimir Putin. You know, he, he's got the, the Russian Orthodox Church right now so much under his thumb. This is his thumb, you know. That they met as, you know, our church met in grand, elaborate, worldwide conference. And they, as much as said, meaning I read it and I see what it says, God wants Russia to rule these, this stretch of countries and land that are, frankly, right now, not inside Russia's borders. It's God's will that that land be ruled by the Russian government. You know what that is? That's a church nobody needs to worry about anymore. It's lost its witness. That's a church that is dreadfully compromised. That's church as long until it repudiates such teaching. I can't expect anything's going to come out of it. You realize the enemy would be glad to see us disappear and would be glad to see us pervert and water down our message. It's when David says, their mouths speak lies and their hands are right hands of falsehood. You can't make a compromise with that. It's not about trivialities. It's about things that mean life and death, a life that is whole before God or a life that is dreadfully broken. So recognizing that, we're, we're looking for God to move, to change us, with the idea that as much as we recognize the evil in the world and there seem to be evil people, we can pretty much identify them. For the most part, the line between good and evil is not between these people and those people, but it goes right down the middle of your heart. And if God is going to be holy and mighty and will not compromise, he's not going to compromise with the sin in your own heart. And are you ready? And lastly, pray for God to rescue. Never doubt that God's hand will reach down and pull you out of the waters. We've seen that, that scene in movies how many times? I was always glad it wasn't me, because I think hands that are in floody waters and are reaching up to be saved look slippery on, to me. I mean, I don't think I could grab anybody and pull them out. But God is the one who, David says, reach down your hand, pull me out of the many waters, and then what? That's the question that goes with that. Then what? When God pull you out the, pulls you out of the water and you stand there safe and getting drier, you say, thank you, that was great, see you later. Really? No. I'm pretty sure this would begin a fresh relationship, a true closeness, a redefining what it means to live onward. You would remain close to this God and your relationship would be that much more fruitful, that much more intimate, because this God has shown how much he loves. You realize God has answered this pr these prayers again and again. David says, come down, and Jesus came. And said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I pour out my spirit on all flesh. God work miracles. And he has done so again and again. Changing the situation so that the foes seem to scatter. It happens over and over. And God has rescued each and every one who has called out to him. It's that rescuing God. It's that powerful God that stands out in this prayer of David. He's one who saves through his power and he's intent on blessing you. So let's pray. So Lord, we ask that, that today we, we not doubt any side of your saving power. That Lord, you are holy and just ask that you make my life holy. Lord, you are, you are the savior of of each and every one of us, and Lord, today we, we reach out our hand for your hand to reach to us. Lord, we recognize that, that you, you have set before us both your power and your compassion, and then we see them both in the cross, and understand I can approach you in your strength and in your holiness, because the cross has settled the price, the debt, the cost, the payment between you and I. So friends, as we're, as we're bowed together, if you want God's power to be at work in your life, in the work of those you love in a mighty way, and you're ready to, to allow him to have his free hand at work, you can put your hand up and say, Lord, that, that's, that's, that's my life. It needs your touch in a mighty way. And if you're ready also to say, God, save me. No wonder the enemy lies. I'm so vulnerable to lies myself. No wonder the enemy tries to make me afraid because I've been afraid so many times. Lord, your hand down, save me now.
the cross has made this possible. Jesus has come. He's demonstrated his power. You can come to him in prayer or at the altar. Let's come.